I want to say again that I am not important. The truth is what's important. I lived in Europe. I was born in Romania. And I was very familiar with it. I was born in 1926. I grew up during the Nazi era. And I grew up with a very intense desire to bring a way into the world that would ensure peace. And I finally had to admit that I had failed. You cannot create a system that will ensure peace. People are not peaceful. You have to begin with people. You have to begin with inspiring individuals to want peace. And how do they want peace? Peace is a negative factor. They have to learn to love each other. And how are they going to do that? I think the best things are example. I have created, as you heard, several communities in the world, and we have about a thousand people living in them. And people who come there say, this is a wonderful way to live. If you can see a few people living that way, you will be able to inspire others to live that way. Talk is cheap. We have to live it ourselves. The more we live in peace, the more other people will feel it. I find when I go to the streets of the city, if I see a glum face, I smile at him. I try to make him feel better. It makes me feel very happy when I see him smile back. Because our goal in life should be to share whatever we have of God with others. I've been extremely happy hearing about this university and all the things that are being accomplished here. I think this is what the world needs. This too is an example for the world. I wrote a book called Education for Life. And in this book, I said that it doesn't matter what children learn to get jobs. Most I think parents want their children to get to become rich so that they'll take care of their parents when they grow old. I think it's always ego in the whole picture. But what does everybody in the world really want? They really want only two things. To get rid of unhappiness, sorrow, pain, and to find happiness. And the worst mafioso in the world, he wants happiness. It's just that he doesn't know how to find it. He thinks he'll find it when he kills people. But that doesn't find, that doesn't bring you happiness. But everybody in the world is looking for this same thing. And for incarnations, we wander, thinking this will make me happy, that will make me happy. There was a story in the Second World War in boot camp. This man was picking up pieces of paper and saying, this isn't it, this isn't it, this isn't it, sort of netty netty. And they finally said, this guy needs to go to the psychiatrist. So they, sent to the psychiatrist, not only did he just pick up pieces of piece of paper off the desk and this and that, this and that. So finally the psychiatrist recommended him for a medical discharge. And as soon as they handed him that, they said, this is it. <laughs> so he rushed out. Well, we need to understand that what we are looking for is not in things, it's in the self. There's a story of a bus there which would at a certain season every year. It secretes in a pouch in its navel the odor of musk. And it runs frantically from bush to bush, tree to tree, stream to stream, trying to find the source of this thing. And sometimes it casts itself off a high crack and it falls to its death. And oh, musk here, if only you had understood that the fragrance you were seeking was in your own self. So what we need is to understand that the truth that we're seeking is not going to be found in science. I've taken issue with your, some of your professors already on this. You can't get it by belief. Hindu teachings are not philosophy. Philosophy comes from the Greek words love of wisdom. Truth, according to Vedanta, is not philosophy. It's wrong to call it Vedanta philosophy, really, because it is truth. It is not love of wisdom, it is wisdom. This is what I hope you all will be teaching, not just intellectual knowledge, 
but to help to know how to get along with your neighbor, how to get along with yourself, how to love people more deeply, how to, how to, the main thing that you need to do on the spiritual path is to get rid of the ego, to get rid of this thought that I am a separate human being, that I don't exist. You are important. I remember I had to be at a lecture at a conference many years ago in Virginia. I come from California, it's a long way away. India is a big country, America is three times as big. And this is the other end of America. Anyway, that's a small point. I was um, the only person there who was on starting new communities. It was the only person there who had actually started a community. And I should say that our closest community now is 44 years old. Well, I invited all these other guests who were famous speakers on the lecture circuit and so on, invited them to dinner in a restaurant. And I was paying for the rest of the meal and everything. And uh, they completely ignored me because I was to them unknown as I was not, wasn't on the lecture circuit. I thought this is absolutely wonderful to be so important, so unimportant that nobody knows I'm here. That's what we should feel, that we don't matter in this world. Truth matters. And what we are trying to do, I very much believe in what I have done in my life. I very much believe in the truth that I have tried to promulgate. And although I'm born in an American body, I know I have lived many incarnations in India. Because when I was first seeking God, I was first trying to find truth in politics, in science, in other ways. I wanted to be a writer, a poet, a playwright, all these things. And I finally reached the point where I realized all of them were brick walls. They were dead ends there. I could not find the truth. I had grown up in an Anglican church, and I didn't like the way they presented God there, so I didn't, it's not that I disbelieved in God, I just couldn't think about it. But finally I realized that there has to be a God. And we have to know what this is about. And I read, remember one night, I took walking out into the night, and if there is a God, I thought, what must he be? And my answer was a very Vedantic one. I thought, well, I am conscious. Therefore, he must be consciousness. And if this is true, then the goal of life must be attuned to attune myself to that consciousness. And I decided from then on I would seek them. And I didn't know at that time that anybody had ever done that before. I thought maybe I'm going crazy. I thought, I cannot live unless I can seek God, unless I can find what it's all about. And I have found something that makes me very, very happy. Every breath I take now is filled with bliss. I feel very happy all the time. And when I look around me and I see people, I know I can't help loving everybody. Because I know they all love the same thing. And this is what I would like to see you teach here, not just philosophy, but love. Such a the bliss. <coughs> and that bliss that we see in everybody. Because that same truth is in every human being. Even if he's just the most depraved person, he still has that gone. And the goal of life, sooner or later, it may take many incarnations, but sooner or later, everybody will have to come to that point where he's desperate to know who he is, what he is, where he fits in this great scheme of things. Our destiny, there's only one religion in the world, and Dharma is Christianity, it's Hinduism, it's Buddhism, it's all true religions, they're false religions also. But it's all true religions, which means everything has come from God, everything must merge back into God. And the most distant planet in the most distant galaxy, that has to be the same religion, if it is true. False religions teach you to worship yourself. False religions teach you to worship man. False religions teach you that you can maybe go to a lower sphere, but 
if he does, kills you and then goes and kills everybody else, is that useful? There are times when you have to put people in prison. Sometimes you have to kill people in the name of peace. Ahimsa does not mean not to harm anybody. It means not to have any harmful principles. And peace too means to have peaceful principles in your heart. Gandhi was a great man, but this truth, Ahimsa, must be understood as an intention, not just an act. And the peace that we want to bring into this world is not enough to be peaceful. I have seen, I remember I was in school in England, and there was a German there, he was a German Jew in fact, but uh, a bully, and he was several classes ahead of me, and I came out of the art room, and he pushed me like this, so I pushed him back, I mean, left a, I'm not going to be anybody's doormat, but I knew what would happen. And he just threw me to the ground for my aggressiveness, started beating me up. And the upperclassmen came in while I was beating on the floor and said, everything's fair, and they backed out of the room because they were afraid of him also. I didn't, I didn't pay any attention to what he was doing. I let him <coughs> beat me up. But after he got tired of it, then fine. But ahimsa does not mean, oh, it's all right, it's all right, and then backing out. Ahimsa means even if they beat you up, let it take it calmly. Don't let it disturb you. And be kindly in your heart. I can say I felt kindly toward him, but I didn't feel angry toward him. It's just one of the things that happened in life. I remember I had another bully in high school when I was 13. I weighed 107 pounds, and this 15-year-old weighed 200 30. It's a little bit heavier, uh, minor. And he decided he could stand me because I had an English accent in those days. I'd gone to school in England, and as I'd grown up in Europe, I really was very American. And uh, he was sitting next to me at the table, and he said, Don't you understand? You're just supposed to stick your spoon from the far side of the plate and press it. I just paid no attention to him. Come, I go away. He said, I'll ever get you and me. When I left the table, I knew what was going to happen. He came up to my room, threw me on the bed, pounded me like this. And I just, he said, we were, we were three floors up. And he said, I'm going to throw you out the window. I'm going to throw you out the window. And I just sat there, lay there, I should say, bleeding, who cares? Otherwise, afterwards, people came to me and said, well, why didn't you cry for help? I wasn't afraid. But that's true, I am sure. Not to wish harm to anybody, not try to get even with it. What I found with it in both these cases was they gave me a wide berth after that. They never bothered me again. We should teach true I am sure in this knowledge. We should teach peace in the sense of not doing harm to anybody. Not wishing harm to anybody. Sometimes you have to hold somebody down. I know there were three upperclassmen who invaded our form in England. And I got one of them sat on him and sat on the other and left it. There was another time a, a boy, and these are the childhood things that you go through. Almost everybody has to go through. And he just, he said, you, you dirty foreigner. And I said, well, maybe you're a dirty Englishman. I didn't mean he was dirty. I said, it's all a question of whether he's had a bath. And so he left at me, and I, I was stronger than he, so I just held him down on the floor. He spat up my head, and finally he got tired of it, and then he got up and I let him go. But I didn't have any ill will toward him. True, I came sharp. We used to have good will, and more than that, respect. Love you can't feel for everybody, even for your own wife. Let's face it, there are times when you must wish that she were a little different. <laughs> but respect you can always have. So in, even in marital relationships, there should be respect. In every human relation, if somebody is a fool, respect him. I remember there was one time when there was one woman whom I considered quite foolish, and she was insisting on my, my doing something. I thought, wait a minute, I have to respect her. So I have to even respect her father. And she gave me some advice, 
And it was good advice. And I took it and it was helpful. So I remember even people who you tend to dis dis discount, if you listen to them, it may be that through them God will tell you something. You know, God uses everybody for, for an instrument. Everybody to teach you lessons. And you can learn from the greatest don't, don't, or the most stupid person. Always listen with respect. You'll find it in that way. I don't want to talk too long here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, ahimsa, kindness. Kindness is very important. Always remember that in everybody, the light of God is there. And when you love people with that light, they will respond to you. Such that I found that complete strangers, many times in the streets, they will smile at me because I have goodwill toward them. That's what we should bring out into the world. I, I was in the restaurant this morning at the hotel I'm staying at, and this, there are two waiters coming by. It looked like a funeral cortege. And I said, Do you ever smile? <laughs> so then he smiled. But we should try. Right? My guru used to say, if you see an unhappy face, face shoot it with the buckshot of your smiles. So smile at everybody and from your heart. Be kind to everybody. And if they are insulting to you, thank them. Because it helps you always to get rid of your ego. And to have other people tell you you're no good is good for you. So when people insult me, I thank them. That's what we, we find in these ways we can bring peace into the world. By example, not by precept, not by, by a, a blue rule or a law or anything like that. I would like to sing to you. I, I, part of my work has been writing music. Um, I used to study singing and uh, I still sing sort of. And uh, um, I wrote about 200 and 420 songs. And this is one. And it's directly making fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> but not really. <laughs> not really. It's making fun of that thought that you can understand things only with your brain. You have to understand also with the heart. So if singers come here, and if you can gather around me up here, or if you like come over there, you'll have to help, help me over there. Thank you. This is a song based on the uh, a story of the a philosopher who knew all the Vedas, and he confronted a boatman. So I put it in Western terminology. Perfect.
In that case, my good man, you are wretched like. Is a golden cross a lost? Why be that the very things of those three men, not a shelf of books who write past? Singing wise, oh, with his book so, such a mighty sorrow as he. Singing wise, oh, with his book so, such a mighty sorrow as he. Now, please tell me, good man. Have you studied the Frenchman Descartes? I've told you before. The other cry. I'm unschooled. Hard work is my art. Singing wise, oh, with his book so, such a mighty scholar as he. Singing wise, oh, with his book so, such a mighty scholar as he.
नमस्कार स्वामी आनंद जी दिस अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सिचुएशन वी फेस इन लाइफ हेट से समथिंग हार्ट टेल समथिंग एल्स टू डू बट दैट अ वेरी प्रैक्टिकल डेली लाइफ इन अ डे टू डे लाइफ especially for managing people for managing society for managing organizations hate tells you that you take action which can be harsh but heart tells you have compassion how do you handle that i i have started uh, a pretty large community about 1000 people live in them the world wide <clears throat> my principle is i basically the two principles one is people are more important than things So if I find that a person is not wanting to do something, I don't force him. If there's a job that he's doing and there's nobody who feels that he wants to do it, I let it go. I don't say people's desires are more important, but their needs are more important. And I think if we think of people's needs before our wish to impose, it will help very much in the management. In the beginning of Ananda, I had many people against me. I had to fight very hard for what I believed in, but I tried to be. I had to respect, try to listen, and try to go with as much as I could without sacrificing my central principles. The other principle is yada dharma tata jaya. Where there is dharma, there is victory, and success and happiness and all the good things. And so, in, I remember I was in the hotel in, in a hospital in. And uh, doctor came in. I had double pneumonia. I was barely conscious. And this doctor came in. Usually he'd come in and ask, "What can I do for you?" He said, "Sir, can you help me?" And well, I said, "I'll try." He said, "I have a son in college who's um, I have to support him. I have many needs in life. How is it possible always to be happy and uh, yet be successful?" I said I have found in my life that I have been dharmic rigidly, and yet I have succeeded. I'm afraid that in my condition at that moment, <clears throat> I was not the best advertisement for success. But I have to say this: for example, when I was, I had to make the money myself for building the mountain. I gave classes all over the San Francisco area to do so, <clears throat> and. I was. It was very hard. We needed money very much, and somebody came to me and said, "I have inherited some money. I would like advice. Should I come and join your community in which I say I will give this money to you, or should I go to India?" I was not even tempted. I thought because he asked me two things, therefore he really doesn't want to come to Atlanta. I said, "Go to India." It could have taken us out of all the problems we had. The money he had was about the modern equivalent of a million dollars. I would not bend. I think if you do that, everything will be right. That saying is not something for the shastras; it's for your own mind. Thank you. Yes. Your karma tells you what your tendencies are. You can 
revivalism be do what you need. Thank you. Yes, madam. The name is? Uh, I am Rupadi. Rupadi Bhutan. Guruji, uh, uh, I just want to ask you that uh, uh, how to define the spirituality exactly and uh, is it possible that we can meet God personally? <laughs> I would define spirituality Religion is not the answer, but spirituality is the answer. If you love God, you'll find there are two, your own offense and there are two influences. You know, you don't have your own thoughts. Your thoughts are rooted in the universe. You reflect those thoughts according to the level of consciousness you are on. I remember one time when I was a young man, I fell into a deep mood. And I tried to get out of this mood, but my reason kept pulling me into it. So I said, well, let me sit, try a new method. I sat down, put my mind very strongly here. Five minutes was all it took. So we need to change our level of consciousness. Spirituality means to open yourself to the grace of God. Everything is good by the end. Yoga is not forcing God's will. Yoga is putting you in tune with the infant. And when you're in tune with that, God doesn't give you his grace because he likes your beautiful brown eyes. He will give you his grace if you, if you live right, if you think right. And when you live, if you live, when you love other people, you're in tune with grace. When you're kind to others, you're in tune with grace. <clears throat> Anything that you do to expand your ego to include other people's will will bring grace. So spirituality means to get rid of this ego, to offer it into the infinite say that he is doing everything and try to live in tune with that. So the more you love God, the more everything will come to you. You can do it yourself. Thank you. Thank you. And yes. Thank you, Mr. Swamiji, for your words and speech. Uh, my name is Suhas Mukherjee from MIT's SSVP. Uh, Swamiji, my question is, uh, whether God is a person or impersonal, and uh, how can I reciprocate with him directly? You know, it depends on the individual. Some people relate very well to the impersonal. Most people relate to something more personal. They love their mothers uh, because they, they feel their love and so on. It depends on you, but in the end, you must realize that God is not a person. God is beyond all that. God is in other, God is outside like that. And uh, when you, when you, well, now I have reached the point where I just want to merge into infinite space. And I don't think of God, but I still think of as my mind. I think of Him as my divine mother. What am I going to say? You call me she all the time is boring. You can't say she because it doesn't make sense either. You can't say his, so God is he, because he is more generically fitted for both men and women if you're talking of human beings. But beyond that is what God is. So any form that you have, just as Ramakrishna, when he worshipped Kali, Tuttapuri King, and he tried to, he told him, I brought Tuttapuri to you. And uh, Ramakrishna uh, didn't, couldn't break through that image of Kali. And finally, Tathapuri had told him to take a knot sword and break through it. He broke through it, then he went into the infinite. You cannot find God until you know him as Thank you. Yes, anyone else? Yeah. Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, myself is Shivaji Mane. I'm working with my arts, commerce, and science college. Uh, sir, my question is to the Samizi. Uh, India has always taken effort into the maintaining peace throughout the country. Even it has also tried to maintain peace uh, uh, with its neighboring countries. But uh, what happens, India suffers a lot because of the neighboring countries. Uh, it is one of a great uh, victim of the terrorism and it is uh, on the outside. So even India is making effort for maintaining peace. But uh, in, uh, I don't know why is it so India is always suffering from the terrorism and all other attacks from the 
every country itself. So, sir, uh, please suggest uh, any solution on this. They know you're referring to you, Dale. Yeah, you're living in a world of data, and it will always happen. Wherever you go, you'll see the two sides. You can't help it. You just be more peaceful in yourself, and it will change. But we're coming to a time of great crisis in the world. It will begin in America, I think. Economic crisis. The dollar won't be worth the paper it's printed out. It will affect India, too. And there's going to be a lot of poverty and starvation and suffering. That will bring world war. You have to be peaceful in yourself. You can't. India will have to go through this. You live on the border of Pakistan. Pakistan is with China. If Pakistan invades India, China will back Pakistan. You're living in a very difficult time. We are. I'm 86, but I'm afraid I may be around for a bit of it. And uh, after this, we're coming into an age when things will be peaceful again. 300 years. Not, not just by talking about it. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. Swamiji, I would like to ask you that there are many people, so many people who talk a lot about spiritualism based on what they have heard or read. Yeah? Uh, but then how can we gently guide these people without hurting their egos as to their inner experiences are more important and to talk about their inner, inner experiences and how can we gently guide them that only love is real. Meditation will give it to you. You won't get it from reading books. The 
more you have the calmness that you get from meditation, the more people can shout at you and do all sorts of things to you, you just remain calm. And when you have one man in an office who lives that way, he influences the whole office. They say that one moon gives more light than all the stars. If you can make yourself peaceful, you will have a very big effect on the world. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, Samitri. Uh, I, uh, I have gone through the autobiography auto auto of uh, Yoga in 1980, when I was in that there were references about his guru, Yukte Shanti, and then there were references about Lahiri Mahasaya and uh, Baba Sahib. Have you met one of them, apart from the Swami Yoga because you are a direct disciple of Yoga and have you felt any vibrations? What are your feelings about that? I'm Ashok we uh, retired from the world. Yes, I spent a lot of time with Ananda Bhai Ma. I loved her very much. I met other saints back in those days. There was one young girl at the age of nine. She wrote a note to her parents that she was going to her room and never coming out. And they would bring her her food and she would uh, play pray for people and they would get well. And I met her just two weeks before she died. Then, I, then two weeks later she, she never came out to see people but she came out to see me. And then um, she was weeping before Krishna and left her body. I have met great saints in India. But in not, not the present time, I came here in 58. Nowadays I have not met any. I hope it comes about again. The roots of India are spiritual. It's bound to come again. But India has had to reclaim its place among the great nations of the world. So it's had to be materialistic. I feel that that trend is changing now. I feel more devotion in the air. And I hope that in the years to come, it will get back to what it used to be. Thank you. Yes, anyone else? <coughs> Yes. yes, yes, my love. Please speak. Uh, sir, this one question which I would really like to ask you. Uh, you always kept on mentioning about love. And what I want to ask you is that how much does the conditionality or the definition that we try to put into it? or the restrictions that we try to put into it affects the kind of love that you are talking about. Does it affect it negatively and if so, how, how to what extent? Oh yes, absolutely. I think many times a woman loves her children, the child dies, mom said to get reborn next door, she won't even recognize it. No, true love is unconditional. You must love people if, even if they hate you. And even if they don't think well of you, it doesn't matter. God is in everybody. Only that kind of love. Otherwise, you will love the, this country and hate Pakistan. Or you will love India, not like America. Or all sorts of things. But we're all children of God. And no different. Every one of us. So unconditional love means no matter what people, how people treat you, be the same toward them. Not the same in hatred, the same in love. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Please. My name is Dr. Vijay Vadek. Any yogic uh, personality like uh, Swami Vivekananda I have already elaborated and the journey of the spirituality the like Kundalini Shakti starts from the Muladhara and reaches to Sastra. What, what's the question I'm sorry? Any spirituality, spiritual highest personality in the world, they have demonstrated that the journey of the highest spiritual power as a Kundalini Shakti starts from Muladhara and reaches to Sastra and the people attains the highest level of the spirituality. In spite of such great personality. I don't understand your words, I don't understand. So far, he said that every great yogi has demonstrated that the great yogi from Mula Khan goes to the Sinistra, that is the greatest and highest attainment. 
Despite of that, still so many great people have already brought, brought into the world, like uh, Naneshwara and Santatukarama, still there are a lot of uh, unrest in complete uh, world. How, uh, what is that, the end that at some point of time everything will be uh, transformed into the peace? Professor, should I say thank you so much? I think uh, let's stand up and give a standing ovation to this great Swamiji and that's my duty.